And we'll get straight into uh, the debate. Let's welcome back for the second year, and we're pleased to have him, Khaled Al Fala. He's the Minister of uh, Energy, Industry, and Minerals. And if that's not enough, he's now the president of OPEC as well. Nice round of applause. <laughs> Maxime Oreskin is the Minister of Economic Development at Russia. Uh, for Russia, again, that's the largest producer side by side with Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Very pleased to have her. I actually had to go to Turkey to go recruit her because she was on a panel I was doing at the World Energy Congress. Isabel Cocher is the CEO of NG of France. And Fatih Birol is the executive director of the International Energy Agency, released a report today, which we'll talk about. One of the foremost experts when it comes to research in the uh, energy space. Nice round of applause for him. Uh, and serving as our front row guest with great pleasure is uh, His Excellency Mohammed Barkindo, who is the Secretary General uh, of OPEC. I see a lot of friends from the energy sector, so I hope you're ready to take some questions. So even if you don't put your hand up and I see you, the only person I'll spare because we had a good knockout fight yesterday, was uh, the CEO of Saudi Aramco, I think that's it, Nasser Amin, who's getting ready for a $2 trillion IPO in 2018. It's excellent to have you in the front row as well. Thanks very much. Uh, before we get started here, in the concept of the sand to snow, uh, bringing our kind of mindset of the Middle East uh, to the mountains of Davos, shall we say, I've uh, accumulated a few sound bites from our debate last week. Uh, his Excellency, the Secretary General of OPEC, is there. Let's listen to what we debated there, and we'll start our discussion uh, after those, uh, those clips. Let's go ahead and roll those. There was a, a convergence of views, a consensus that had been reached across industry, not only between us, OPEC and non-OPEC, but also IOCs and other stakeholders, that there was now an urgent need to assist the market in bringing forward this rebalancing process because of the severe consequences of uh, uh, this cycle. I think they did a remarkable job putting forward the strongest statement possible to the market. But I have some concerns that if we get any wavering in terms of compliance, that there's so much bearish sentiment waiting to come back in. We know that if we want to really rebalance the market, which means bringing back inventories to a more normal level, it will not take six months. This year, coming back from 28 to 55, you know, it's positive outcome. But let's be clear, it's volatility is still there. If prices continue at the 55 to $60 band for the next year, I would expect a much more aggressive increase in production in the United States than is currently being anticipated by the international agencies such as the IEA or the EIA. There you go. It's pretty good selection there, uh, including from the Secretary General finishing up with the U.S. State Department. Uh, Amos Hochstein is very uh, bullish on the, the shale recovery that's going to take place. Uh, uh, Minister Alfali, when we uh, sat in Abu Dhabi just last week, you made... Uh, some news, as they say, by suggesting that Saudi Arabia has brought down its production in the spirit of the OPEC, non-OPEC agreement with 24 countries down below 10 million barrels a day. That's the first time we've done that in nearly two years. Um, how long is that uh, level of production going to last? Do you think it's necessary to sustain that through the first half of 2017 or a willingness to carry that through uh, out uh, 2017 to make sure that this market not only rebalances, but that Saudi Arabia, the largest player within OPEC, uh, is willing to lead by example. Well, thank you, John. I, you know, the, the commitment that we have made is for six months. And the six months uh, versus a longer <coughs> period was debated and thought about, and the market forces supply, demand were simulated with a number of scenarios considered. And we came to the conclusion that uh, the most likely, uh, you know, the most probable uh, outcome, given uh, the expected uh, high level of compliance, is that the markets will rebalance in the first half. This is assuming demand pickup of 1.3 million uh, barrels. Uh, and given the level of supply we've seen by year end and the caps that have been established by the 25 countries that were uh, around the table. Um, and Saudi Arabia, as always, as always, sets the example. Our compliance 
record is unmatched. But I think the difference this time is that the severity of the downturn over the last two years has led everybody who came around on December 10 from OPEC and non-OPEC to come on their own, fully convinced that uh, there needs to be uh, a collective effort, that this is not something to be done by one country or two countries or even the 13 countries of OPEC. The reason we went outside and worked with 11 countries uh, led by Russia uh, as the largest non-OPEC producer is that this consensus has developed, that OPEC alone cannot do it. It needs to be done for, for the good of consumers uh, and, and uh, producers. Uh, our compliance level will be maintained for the entirety of the six months. The good news is, is that since the agreement in December, people take, started taking action then. December levels are lower than November. The first two weeks has been very, very strong compliance, going the extra mile. Uh, every country I have talked to uh, has uh, matched, and the majority of them have exceeded their committed cuts, some of them by a large margin. Uh, so uh, I think compliance is good. Markets, of course, always have anxiety. As you mentioned, show me the money, show me the cuts. End of January is not far away. I think the numbers will come. But uh, the, the transparency of data is not perfect, but it's far better now than 10 years ago or 20 years ago. There are monitoring agencies now that, that look at loading uh, and production. Many companies who work around the world disclose their production levels. So there is a, a very high level of uh, uh, data available today that shows that the first uh, part of January has seen higher compliance than, than, than the commitment. And I think as this anxiety about commitment goes down, the market confidence in the quality of the agreement will improve. Uh, Fatih Birol, you put out, and I'm glad we did the panel today, your latest uh, energy outlook for the International uh, Energy uh, Agency. And it said it's too soon to tell when this market will rebalance. The reason I ran that clip from Patrick Poyanet of uh, Total is because he is a believer it may take uh, up to two years to hold together this OPEC, non-OPEC agreement before the market really rebalances or not? Where do you sit there as the executive director of the IEA? Uh, thanks, John. Uh, now, as uh, uh, Khalid said, we are seeing that the oil producing countries are determined to implement the agreement. And this is uh, bought by the market. And we have seen prices uh, increasing 55, 56, even $57. This is fine. But what we have been saying, anticipating another fact we should take into consideration, namely, what does this increase in prices mean for other producers? First of all, U.S. shale oil. We have released our oil market report uh, 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 today. And what we see is, John, December 16, December 17, an expectation of 500,000 barrels per day, half a million barrels per day, increase in shale oil. Last year, 2016, was a decline, and 17, we see an increase. And this will, a lot of oil will be poured in the market, number one. Number two, if the prices remain at these levels or higher, I wouldn't exclude that we, will, we can revise this number up in the next months to come. Even in 2017, more than half a million if the, if the prices go up, we may well do it. Number three, it is not only United States, Brazil, Mexico, China, Colombia, we may well see that the, they will react to the higher prices. And number four, and finally, talking about more oil coming to the markets, demands, because demand is also related to price, the higher prices may also put a downward pressure on the oil demand growth. We have seen in the United States, November, December numbers, they are much weaker than the rest of the year as a result of higher prices. So uh, to sum up, a price increases uh, there, very uh, visible effects are there, and, uh, but we also, we also see 
counter effects from coming from uh, US and elsewhere in terms of production and maybe in terms of slower demand uh, growth. Good. The demand growth that you're projecting now in your report today was 1.3 million barrels a day for 2017. Again, on the upside in 2016 with gr demand growth on a daily basis of 1.5 million barrels a day. So the, this energy market remains much more resilient than many thought. You re made a reference to shale. I'd like to bring up our, our first graphic. And I got this uh, from Wood McKenzie, uh, who helps support us in terms of the uh, uh, the production here. I wanted to go back to 2011 to show the audience uh, where we came from. This is U.S. oil production. It does not include the liquids. I just wanted to have uh, c comparisons, basically oranges to oranges, if you will. So going from uh, less than 4 million barrels a day in January 2011, look at that peak uh, above uh, 7.3 for oil, again, not mixed with fluids. And look at that steep drop down. We lost about 1.3 million barrels a day and the projection to go right back up by the end of 2000. In 18. Uh, Isabel Cocher, uh, you're in the, the gas business. You have some oil production. Uh, how do you see it as a CEO of a global energy player, the elasticity in the market today? Is it impressive how quick producers can adapt in the world before you used to, uh, you'd idle a project and it'd take months, if not longer, to get a project back on board? This redefines the supply of oil and gas, does it not? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, John. You know, uh, paradoxically, it's much more difficult to predict the immediate future rather than the, the long-term trends. Uh, what impressed me, you know, uh, being uh, here in Davos and discussing with a lot of people, and also during the conversation I can have as a lot of you in the, in the room, uh, with governments or, or players uh, from the private sector, is convergence. Convergence on the very long-term long -term trends. Convergence, we could summarize saying uh, strong business case for renewables, strong business case for gas, probably uh, a move towards much more decentralized energy systems, meaning that the production will be for a significant part, some specialists say 50%, on the site of consumption. Convergence also to say that the electrification will progress. That is to say that uh, vehicles, for example, which are used to uh, be fueled by oil, uh, will be probably massively fueled by, by power in this case. And convergence on the fact that it, all these trends are positive in terms of energy access, in terms of decarbonization, etc. What is impressive is to see that at the opposite, the immediate future is uncertain and probably more than ever. And the discussion for the beginning of, of this meeting showed that. And, 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 and remember the, the recent drop of uh, oil prices. You started the meeting uh, uh, with this point, which was not expected at all. Mm. Uh, well, it's an incitation for, for all of us to be modest on our ability to predict the immediate future. So it's my, that's my point. It's the paradox between long-term trends, which are clear, and well, volatility in the in the uh, years to over the years to come, which is huge. And from this point of view, I believe that every measure to reduce the uncertainty, the volatility, is good. Good for states, good for industrialists. And from this point of view, the agreement, uh, the OPEP, uh, and some of uh, other countries that are available to to reach is an extremely good news because it is part of an effort to stabilize the view in order to help us to, to make the, the right arbitrage. Uh, you, you know, maybe another point uh, on the another important uh, issue is CO2 price. A big part of the uncertainty comes from the fact that we have no CO2 price scheme, not CO2 uh, uh, no, no, no possibility to really value uh, CO2 savings. We all believe that it will come one day, when, which price, which kind of scheme. It would be also, as the OPEP agreement, uh, really something important for, for, for all the players. Good. Uh, Maxine Rexon, it's great to have you as the Minister of Economic Development. Uh, you're not Alexander Novak, obviously, the Minister of Energy, who's been collaborating with the man on your right. Uh, but I'm sure you're here with a, a message for this audience at the same time. Uh, the latest numbers show through December that uh, Russia is still producing 11.22 million barrels a day. That's right near an all-time high. Uh, we've seen the commitment from Saudi Arabia going below 10, 
from a peak in the autumn of 10.7 million barrels a day. Uh, which commitment uh, can you make today to suggest you really will hit this reduction of 300,000 barrels as a country uh, to live up to the agreement? Well, the commitment that we did is unchanged. So we are fully <coughs> compliant and we are proceeding with a schedule that was agreed. So no news here actually at all. And for the market as a whole, as well, the station that we see is that if you look at the forward curve, you'll see that it's flat, which means that there is no excess supply more on the short end of the curve, which is very important because it shows the sustainable state of the market. And in my opinion, uh, there is almost no risk on the supply side anymore for the market. What type of risk should we discuss? It's on the, on the demand side and mainly on what will be happening with the global economy. IMF has the forecast for this year of 3.4. It will mean that the growth of demand for the market will be strong. But if anything bad happens in countries like United States and China, it will impact the, the oil market. But of course, it will be not the oil market that will be impacted by such a situation. It will be a global economy that will be impacted. There's a different way to look at that price uh, projection as you're making uh, for the next three months in the futures market. Uh, we've been capped after a good 30% rally uh, around $54 to $55 a barrel. It was the same thing before we sat down today. Uh, Minister Ofala, you correctly predicted we could get very close to $60 a barrel at the end of 2016. We're very close because we got to 58. Uh, what do you feel comfortable with in 2017, looking at where we are in the first month of the year? I, I don't think I was trying to be tricky. I was pretty direct. <laughs> <laughs> Too direct. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, it's always uh, risky to predict prices of, uh, of anything, but certainly oil is, is too unpredictable. Too many variables. Um, other speakers spoke about supply uh, risks, demand risks, uh, global macroeconomic risks. We have currencies uh, and things of that sort. Um, and then we've, we have countries that have constraints that also have their own issues that could take us up or down. So, so these are geopolitical risks that we have uh, no view on. Uh, but I think the, the, the broad lines that are driving this market are all uh, driving it towards uh, not only rebalancing during 2017, but as I have said uh, uh, earlier uh, during the year 2016, are actually driving the market towards a shortage, uh, not too long into the future, hmm. uh, towards the end of this decade, um, 18 to 20, depending on how much investment we, we have and, and, and whether there are any uh, unanticipated disruptions. So, and that has been one of the drivers. I think uh, people are fixated on price as if it is, uh, Price is an indicator, and it's a, it guides the market, uh, investors. It impacts demand, but really, what what uh, what I'm focused on, and my colleagues in OPEC uh, are converging on this, is what we need to focus on: is supply and demand and global inventories. And this is our job. This is what we should be paid to do. And if we do it right, the price will find its natural equilibrium. I can tell you, if I want to talk about prices that if you look at the last quarter of 2016, prices were in the 50s. We had already indicated that we're going to have an agreement. But look at where the budgets for 2017 are. You know, there is still no, not enough investment flows going into projects. You know, we hope that shale will recover to a reasonable degree and that it will contribute. But it's not enough. I don't lose sleep that shale is going to come and overwhelm us. I don't think it will. What actually we need is long cycle projects, the projects that need 10 and 20 and $30 billion that are going to be producing the 200, 300 and 500,000 because we have declined. You know, the, 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 the existing base of 95 million barrels declines between three to 5% year on year. That's three to 5 million barrels that, that goes away. So we have to plow in hundreds of billions of dollars of a year as, 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 as an industry to just stay still, mm. let alone to meet the 1 to 1.5 million barrel year on year uh, demand increase. And we hope that unconventional US shale, other unconventional oil will take part of that, but it will also require massive investments. 
it will also require a supply uh, chain industry and a service industry that can maintain that growth. And I would just caution that costs on the way down are going to be different from costs on the way up. It's like climbing. You know, climbing up is a lot more difficult than walking down the slope. So as we start climbing, costs will go up. Prolific acreage that has been supported, the resilience of shale will, will run out. And we will see the inflation, maybe not to the same level, but we'll see some of the inflation that we saw earlier uh, this decade. So, so cap the production is what you're suggesting that I think it will be moderated. I think it will be moderated by these forces. This is this is just natural. It's not a bad prediction that I am making. But I think it is it is what keeps me focused that we have to invest in Saudi Arabia. Others have to invest in conventional oil, and we have to uh, anticipate that unconventional will take part of the growth, and we welcome that. Hmm. Uh, what is a Goldilocks price where you don't invite? Uh, deep water projects that start to flood uh, the market today. You, uh, never, you never give up, John. I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've been in this band for four or five months, between 45 and 55. Let's put it that way. But do you feel more comfortable between 55 well, I, and 65? I, I, I think, like I said, uh, we've, we've been in the, in, in the 40s to 50s, and it didn't, it didn't br bring enough investments. And we know prices in the three-digit range uh, really brought... Uh, too much uh, investment flows that flooded the market. So somewhere in between, and it's going to be impacted by inflation, currencies, uh, demand response, uh, things of that nature. So I'll be a fool to, 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 you know, to give a narrow range, but I think it's safe to say that it's you know, somewhere in, 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 in that range of between 50 and 100. <laughs> oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a really, really wide range for Goldilocks. You, can, you can't even find the path going forward. I was thinking the range of 55, 65. I don't think you disputed that. There you go. Fatih Barol. Um, what is a sustainable yeah. price, I'm trying to find out, that keeps investment coming in? Uh, the latest report, projection for 2017, we'd see $450 billion uh, go back into the uh, fossil fuel sector, if you will in 2017, a rise of 3%. The first time that's risen in three years. Uh, as His Excellency was suggesting, it's not enough uh, to keep pace with demand. What is a good balance? And before you answer that, can we bring the graphic up? I wanted to show the break-even price per barrel uh, for a range of different producers around the world. It's tough to see the bottom of the screen. That $54 is for the majors. Uh, in the center, you see 46 uh, dollars a barrel, and that's for Russia, and that's the different Russian producers. And that one on the right is the uh, Asian producers. I just want to give us a, a global reach. That would include, of course, China and uh, many, uh, producers like uh, Petronas, for example, uh, in Malaysia. So Russia at $46, the majors at 54. This is break even cash flow uh, looking at the IOCs as well. So Patrick Foynet said something very prescient when I interviewed him about four or five months ago from Total. He said, we know the pain of 40. We don't want to feel 40 again. Uh, what is a range that sustains this level of production and, as the minister suggested, the level of investment as well? If we can get this picture again. Uh, Please, of, bring that uh, uh, there. Yeah. No, no, not uh, this one, but the other one. The next one. We just saw. Yeah. Thanks. It means if this graph is right, today all the oil in the world can be produced. So we have, we have 55. Then uh, this would be... Definitely not a good news for some of the producers uh, here, because all of the oil majors, Russian, Asian, all of them can be produced with 55. Now, I have two important, I believe, points to underline here. Number one, don't estimate, underestimate the shale oil reaction. It may well be uh, strong, and it may well put a, later on a downward pressure on the prices. This don't underestimate it. What does this mean? This means the oil markets are very different than before. We are going to see major volatility in the markets. In other words, we are entering a period of greater oil price volatility. And what does this mean? This means, especially for some of the producers, it is now time to diversify their economies away from oil only because oil prices may go down and their economies may be very vulnerable 
to, to those price changes. We have seen uh, Emirates, for example, you were there, John. Uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, making some uh, reforms in the Saudi Vision 2030. But for in the case of, I would like to very much hear the, the uh, minister's views in terms of Russia, uh, the test, test, if I may say so, in the last uh, years, uh, was not a very successful one in terms of uh, Russia. Russian economy suffered uh, a lot. So therefore, this should remind us, this volatility of the oil prices, now and in the future, may well be a reason to diversify the economies from oil and gas revenues and making much more broader. This is number one. Number two, one number which worries me a lot, and I discussed this with, uh, with uh, my colleague, with uh, Mohammed and, and, and others. Namely, 2015 and 2016, two years in a row, global oil investments decline. And it is the first time we see it in the history of oil. Mm. And looking at the current plans of the, uh, the companies, it may well be the case that 2017, we do not see a significant rebound, maybe even a decline, a third year in a row. And what does this mean? This may well mean that in a few years of time, we may see a gap between demand and supply, which could put all of us in difficult situation. So therefore, if there are no major investment in 2017, the alarm bells are ringing for the oil markets in a few years of time. So these are the two remarks I wanted to make. Thank you. Uh, Isabel, uh, are you investing in more projects now that you see not only this oil price, but uh, the gain in gas prices as well? Gas is an incredibly competitive market, and you've got uh, operations in 70 countries uh, around the world. Are you uh, going full steam ahead with investment or not at this stage? Uh, yeah, uh, important to say first that this is a transition, what we are speaking about for the beginning here. It, it won't happen overnight. And, and we try to manage it like that, like a transition, trying to be, to be clear on where are the big spaces for, for, for growth. And, and again, we see big... <coughs> Uh, spaces for growth, for renewable, for gas, and for distributed energy. Behind that, you have again uh, the socialized systems managing, producing, and storing energy also. So, the, in this transition pace, the role of the industry, and I'm here in one sense, I'm the, the representative of the, of the business, uh, the, the, the role of each industry, each player is to find the best way to accompany the countries in this uh, transition, in this diversification of, of their economy. And each player tries to try to, to play with uh, the cards uh, he, he has in his own, own game. And we have, uh, if I say now a word about NG, we have the incredible chance, and that's the heritage I got from my predecessor, Jérôme Estralet, uh, to have well, key competences in all the domains that we believe will grow in the future. And then we have made strong choices to align fully our portfolio of activities on these new solutions. Solutions based on gas, and gas which will be progressively itself renewable. We work a lot on, on that. It's a question of, you speak about, you, you heard maybe about uh, Hydrogen, for example, which is a way to green the gas, or biogas, but gas is needed to stabilize the energy systems. Uh, so gas, uh, we bet a lot on renewables. Um, every technology will be necessary. We will need to, to gather uh, regarding the resources of each country. In some cases, a lot of potential in, on geothermal, uh, for example, uh, technologies. In some cases, a uh, lot of wind, and everywhere, power, solar. Solar energy will, I'm convinced of that, play a big role in the, in the future energy mix, a future cocktail. It won't be the only part, but it will be a, a big one. So we bet on gas, we bet on renewable, and we bet on energy savings and local energy <coughs> management systems. Let me follow up with you quickly. My question is quite direct. Uh, at this level and the recovery you've seen in gas prices, which has not been as pronounced as we've seen in oil prices, are you putting money on the table to the point of Mr. Barol's statement here that we 
and Mr. Alfale that we're behind the curve when it comes to investment. Do you feel comfortable as NG taking on new projects in natural gas at this level? Our métier is not to be a gas producer, or not mainly to be a gas producer or oil producer. Our métier is to transform this resource in something which is useful for the customer. And then, well, the question for me is not this one. The question is, what are the fuels, what are the, the energy systems that will be able to be affordable for clients? And gas will be, sure, I'm sure of that, because, uh, and it's true today already, gas is competitive. I don't know if you know that, but to, uh, to manage the eating of your, your home is much uh, uh, less expensive than if you uh, organize this uh, eating, betting on power, 35% less. So gas is a competitive and a very flexible energy. That's the reason why it is part of our, our bets on the, on the future. Not the only one, it is a cocktail. I believe in integrated systems, mixing energies, mixing solutions with a big part of digital. Because if we believe that a significant part of energy will be managed on site, you cannot do that without having IoT, Internet of Things, without having a strong uh, field of development for uh, softwares. So without having a strong data management system, because you need to automatically balance the system real time. Okay. I want to follow up on one other oil question. I'm just going to ask uh, the Secretary General of uh, OPEC, uh, Mohamed Barkindo, in the front row. Uh, he has a microphone on already. Uh, this is a, a question that's come up and presented to me time and time again. Uh, it did so last week in Abu Dhabi and again here in Davos. Uh, when will the 1.8 actually in cuts between the 24 countries of this uh, crowning achievement, as Minister Novak called it, of Russia, be delivered? That this is why the market seems to be flat today. When will all 1.8 million barrels of cuts be delivered in the first half of the year? Do you, you're going into a meeting this, this weekend on, uh, in Vienna uh, with the monitoring uh, committee for the first time. Uh, what can you tell us going into the meeting about when we'll see all 1.8 delivered, uh, so there's full transparency. Uh, thank you, thank you, John. I think you have heard from the conference president himself on the level of commitment uh, we are seeing from all participating countries in this new broad uh, platform that we created on the 10th of uh, December in, in, in Vienna. Uh, the level of commitment and enthusiasm uh, that we are witnessing, being in regular contact. He's also been in contact with his colleagues. Uh, I think is almost unparalleled in OPEC. Uh, we've been around for quite a while. We've seen several cycles and it efforts. A, it was the first agreement since 2002. Yeah. But I'm not being tricky. I've been looking for a specific answer here. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about people cutting. Uh, the gentleman to my left has made his cut already. Uh, surpassing the 486,000 barrels he promised. The, the, duration, the duration of this uh, declaration of cooperation is six months. Uh, that took effect uh, two weeks ago on the 1st of January. And the roadmap uh, is the uh, adoption of a mechanism of compliance, which the Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee uh, will hopefully do on Sunday this weekend in Vienna, based on which uh, they will ensure compliance uh, beginning from uh, next month. And the averages for the six months uh, will reflect the almost 1.8 million combined uh, OPEC, non-OPEC, that uh, would be adjusted uh, uh, from supply. So it's work in progress. Uh, the building blocks are being put in place, but the level of commitment, it's very high. Great. I appreciate the uh, candor. I, I want to spend a few minutes, if we can, here on the kind of giant elephant that didn't show up to Davos. That would be Donald Trump, I think. is a pretty fair comment. I think there's an inauguration tomorrow that's taking place. It, it has implications for the energy market. It has implications for relations uh, uh, with Russia. We heard from the Obama administration here in Davos uh, and also from President Obama himself suggesting that the sanctions that are in place in Russia already should be maintained, uh, that uh, Russia needs to prove it's a, a, a common player in, in the global community. Your thoughts on this uh, last uh, shot across the bow to Russia 
before Mr. Obama vacates the White House? Well, there was actually a question also on the Russian economy, so we'll try to mix both of them. So the reason why we were not performing that well in the past couple of years is that in the late 2014, we've decided to fully adjust to a new environment for a country, to low oil prices, to sanctions. Total shock to the balance of payments of Russia was 13% of GDP, and we've adjusted to it fully. So if you look at the results of 2016 with oil at 40, we have a positive current account, we have a small fiscal deficit, so sustainable state of the economy. So it also means that we have not only adjusted to low oil prices, but to sanctions. So what we prefer to do at the moment to concentrate on our own problems, our structural stories within the country. We're not thinking much about the sanctions. You're not thinking much about the sanctions. Do you expect that Donald Trump would be, he's already said he would like to work with Vladimir Putin. This is one of, the, is one of his first measures uh, as president, the first quarter of his presidency to lift those sanctions so he can work with Russia. And what do you expect from Mr. Trump? Tell us. <laughs> I, I expect that he has a lot of Twitters. Uh, Twitter feeds, and, uh, and I'm sure he keeps CNN in his sights. He's tried to rename us last week, so we have to be on our toes, as they say. So we'll see what will be on the agenda. Do you, you think it's possible, though, that the sanctions... We'll see. I don't yeah, know. It's too early to predict know. that. Yeah. Very we'll good. Uh, a question for uh, His Excellency <laughs> Mr. Alfala. Um, it was a pretty outlandish proposal on the table. It's about putting a, a tariff on imported oil into the United States. That would be pretty radical. Do you think he's... Uh, bluffing? Does he want better cooperation with the major oil producers like Saudi Arabia and Russia in the world? How damaging would that be uh, to relations between the United States and Saudi Arabia? Well, the, you know, the U.S. is the largest uh, market uh, for oil and gas. It's also a significant producer of, uh, of both, uh, as well as of other energy sources. Everybody uh, knows this. It is the most integrated market and economy uh, across the world through trade, through technology development. The U.S. companies uh, are the most international and they're present uh, around the world. A lot of wealth has been created globally and domestically in the U.S. through uh, integration in the global economy. Uh, and the U.S. is the champion of uh, both uh, capitalism and globalization. Uh, but the U.S. Uh, leadership is always looking for new formulas to create more value. And, and uh, you hear a lot of proposals, but ultimately I have confidence that what will happen in the U.S. Is, will be the right thing. It will be the right thing for the U.S. and for the U.S. partners. Saudi Arabia has been a key uh, partner of the U.S. in trade, energy uh, for sure. Despite all of the transformations that we have talked about, rising production in the U.S., efficiency, markets in the East rising, we remain the number two supplier of petroleum to the U.S., second only to Canada. Uh, we supply more to the U.S., believe it or not, than we supply to China, uh, despite all of the mega trends on, on, uh, on both uh, ends. And uh, I believe policymakers and decision makers and Congress ultimately will do the right thing. I think they're looking at a host of reforms, including tax reforms and, and, and so on and so forth. They, uh, one comment on this specific, and I haven't studied it, so I, so I have to be very careful. That's unusual. You read pretty much everything. As a minister of three agencies, uh, right? Minerals, industry, and oil. You're a pretty but wide brief the, these the days. US, we all know that the U.S. has a very uh, strong uh, downstream industry. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are a big exporter in the U.S. The U.S. continues to import millions of barrels of crude oil. That's not going to disappear. Uh, so any tariffs on imported feedstocks into the U.S. is going to hurt the competitiveness of these uh, industries. The U.S. also exports a lot of products out of its refining processes and petrochemicals. So if you increase the cost of imports into uh, the U.S. economy, the competitiveness of production coming out of the U.S., I'm sure, again, that's going to be taken into consideration. And as I mentioned, uh, there are a lot of smart people within the Trump uh, administration and team, and ultimately we have confidence that they will do the right thing. Okay, follow up on another important issue. Uh, 
uh, Mr. Trump has suggested he would tear up that uh, agreement within the P5 plus one structure uh, with Iran. Uh, Fatih Biro, would that be a mistake to take uh, Iran out of the umbrella, out of that context of keeping them in with a dialogue here? They've made a recovery of oil production up to nearly 4 million barrels a day after sanctions. Is it better to be confrontational with Iran, as you see it for the United States, or to be more collaborative? It's a mistake to ask this question to me, John, so this is, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, as an international civil servant, it is definitely something uh, beyond uh, uh, my immediate uh, profession. But, of course, Iran, like other uh, Middle East countries, is a very important uh, producer. And uh, I would like to now tell you a few things about U.S. versus Middle East in terms of oil. Now, yes, U.S. oil production in my view, will increase significantly. But let's do not forget, U.S. is still today a significant oil importer. Why Middle East is so important is that because Middle East is a major oil exporter, feeding China, feeding Asia, India, other countries. So therefore, even the U.S. oil production increases significantly, U.S. will never replace Middle East as the oil exporter. Middle East is and will remain the center of global oil map for many years to come. So for, uh, therefore, we have to watch what is happening in Middle East carefully and hope that oil industry, energy industry, geopolitics all go smoothly in a positive sense. This is a, a point that we also understand. But second point on natural gas, because we should also tell, talk a bit uh, natural gas as well. In terms of natural gas, US will be a major exporter. LNG coming from United States and Australia will change the dynamics of gas markets. And therefore, there will be a strong competition between pipeline exporters and the LNG exporters. And this will uh, definitely be good for the uh, gas importers because competition is always beneficial for all of us. And we shouldn't also forget, you talked about the climate change a few minutes ago. Gas can play a positive role in terms of reducing the emissions if it replaces coal, as we have seen in the United States. Yes, and Major Iran... Major reduction in the U.S. emissions as a result of gas replacing coal. Great. Uh, Iran has the largest gas reserves in the world. They're just rubbing up. So your argument is probably to keep engaged with Iran. I know the political sensitivity of it. Uh, Isabel Kosher, a very quick answer, if we can here. Do you worry that Donald Trump will uh, get the United States out of the COP21 agreement? Uh, for, to control the pace of climate change? Well, I spoke about uncertainty, volatility. Of course, the election of uh, Donald Trump from this point of view it is an additional uh, question. If the question is, would it be uh, a risk uh, to see this mega trend, uh, this energy transition really happening, I believe that the answer is no for several reasons. Maybe I could mention two. The first one is that this mega trend it is sustained by very strong interest. And we could take the example of emerging countries. Imagine for a sub-Saharan country, African country, for example, for some of these countries, they are obliged to fully import from outside their energy resources to fuel their growth. And suddenly, they see a new potential, which is on their own territory, which is the wind, which is geothermal, which is uh, solar, and which is, in fact, a way to fuel the growth without increasing the, the dependency vis-a-vis -vis neighbors. So that's a key trend, or that's a key interest that will, in my view, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but make this trend absolutely uh, uh, <laughs> impossible to stop if somebody would like to. The second reason mm. is, uh, and it is affordable again, economically speaking, it makes, it makes sense. It will lead to a decrease of energy prices. So you're suggesting we've come so far along on the climate change agreement that even if the US stepped out, uh, the momentum would be to continue uh, with those policies. Yeah, in my view, yes. I don't know if it could have a, a more impact on pace but not on the final uh, goal, I don't believe. Uh, plus the fact that if we believe that part of the system will be decentralized, the decision will be 
less and less ba made by the states and more and more by cities, by industrialists, even by citizens in some cases. So I don't believe it can be really a, a risk. But a lot of questions, I agree. Okay. Uh, let me pose a final question here, and then I'm going to take some questions from the floor for five minutes. Uh, Javed Sarif, the foreign minister of Iran, was suggesting that Saudi Arabia and Iran can cooperate uh, on many fronts in the future. It's not as confrontational as many people think. Uh, you and I sat down for an interview uh, in Istanbul at the World Energy Congress, and at the time you had said, suggested, and even back at the OPEC meeting when we sat down together uh, in June of last year, uh, that Saudi Arabia and Iran can collaborate when it comes to energy. I think you did set the example uh, that you could find a compromise. Uh, before you took over as minister, we had a big showdown in Doha, and uh, the previous minister left. There was no agreement. It was all blamed on tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran. As it advanced now to a stage when it comes to business and regional stability that the two can work together? Well, first of all, uh, I don't think it's right to characterize uh, the, the, you know, not reaching an agreement in Doha as a Saudi-Iranian thing. It's just the conditions weren't right at that time where everybody came uh, to, to the consensus we were able to uh, reach by November of, uh, of this year. OPEC, as, as we like to see it, is apolitical. It's, uh, it, 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 it's a grouping of companies that have a common interest in stabilizing global markets, bringing supply and demand together, and reducing the volatility and uncertainty that uh, Isabel has spoken about from an industry standpoint. I know the consumers, the airlines, transport companies, petrochemical companies lose uh, sleep and some of them lose their, their well-being uh, because of the unpredictability of uh, energy markets. Individual consumers also, when they're buying appliances or cars, they, they, they're, they're making uh, a bet on, on where energy prices. So we have, we have that responsibility uh, to, to, to mitigate this to the maximum extent possible and we're willing to do it with everybody. And, uh, We've been able to do it with Russia, and Russia is an outside member of OPEC, but we've had a very strong alignment, despite the fact that we've had our differences uh, on some issues like Syria uh, and, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, likewise, uh, Iran is, uh, is, 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 is part of uh, OPEC. If I'm not mistaken, Mohammed, they may be a founding member uh, of OPEC and will be willing to work with them and long term, uh, I, I, I want to reiterate what my leadership has said and, and what people who run Saudi Arabia's foreign policy have said. We have no problem with Iran the nation. We have no problem with Iran the people. Iran is in the Middle East to stay. And we want the day when we have no barriers of collaboration with Iran whatsoever. And we hope that they will migrate uh, and quickly get to that state where we can work with them uh, like a brotherly Muslim state and, and find common platforms to cooperate and collaborate in many other fields. And, and if, if working together with OPEC leads them to change their behavior into that direction, then, then we welcome it. But I have to also say that there are big problems and, and ultimately what Mr. Zarif has to do is back his words with action. And when we see the turmoil and the suffering and the tragedy in Syria. We see what's happening in Yemen. We see what happened in Bahrain before with interference uh, and elsewhere in the Middle East, in Lebanon. Uh, we question these statements. So we hope to see action that will demonstrate the real intent. Thank you for the candor. A final question to Minister Areskin. Uh, Vladimir Putin moved very quickly to realign with some strategic partners in the Middle East, one being Turkey, uh, the other one Iran, uh, re-engaged Israel, we've got all kinds of uh, new alliances here. Would it be a mistake for the Trump administration to... Uh, you, buy... once, you once again about Trump. We're talking about the energy market, not about Trump. <laughs> it's a different panel. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Let's get to the questions. That was my question. <laughs> Good. Let's take one or two questions from the floor. We have one there. If we have a microphone handy. Again, I ask for brevity. Is there a second hand, and we'll have to wrap it up. And one here in the second row. Thank you. My name is Hadi Fathallah, Namaya Group Dubai, and a member of the Global Shippers community from Erbil, Iraq. 
Uh, my question is to the two ministers, what's your plan B if prices don't go up? Will you flood the markets? Will you compete? How, what, what is your plan B? And uh, uh, the second question is, if, I mean, why did we go all through this trouble if we don't have this major impact or direct impact on how Platts calculates the Brent benchmark? So why do all this maneuvering if there is no direct effect on the price benchmark calculation? Thank you. Good. It's nice to see somebody else have to ask these nasty questions. It's all yours. <laughs> you no, know, I think, I think uh, plan B is, is to be resilient uh, and, and, and to be flexible and to deal with the circumstances. Certainly, there are many variables uh, that, that we can't predict. So somebody talked about a potential uh, demand uh, collapse, you know, geopolitical, macroeconomic impact. We'll have to uh, react. And, and there has been times in the past where OPEC has taken one action and then a few months later found out that that action was not sufficient and followed up with another action. We will not exclude that. That's why we're meeting again in May. Hmm. Are you within, suggesting within... that potentially if needed, uh, would you embark on uh, fresh cuts if needed? If needed, absolutely. If, uh, if what we think is probable takes place, I believe that it will not be necessary. So we're flexible, adaptable, resilient, resourceful, all of these good words. Uh, you know, this is part of the theme here, uh, here, here in Davos. As far as plats and benchmarks, I think these these are important, but they're small in the margin. You know, the absolute price is the absolute price, what the market can afford and what will bring supply and demand. How you assess it is, is in the small number of cents versus, uh, you know, the, the absolute uh, Good. Basis. But I don't want to read too much into your words because I want to be very careful, but uh, as an organization, the, the, you know, the players within OPEC at least, are you open to take that agreement for the entire year if you find it necessary in the market, the agreement you have on the table? We've talked about that, and that is, that is, uh, that is uh, in fact, it was one of the options. And, and again, when we, when we modeled the impact on inventory of implementing the 1.8, we were gonna cross into the five-year average by mid-year. So why extend it? Extending it would create a shortage too early, which we don't want to do. Our intent is to balance the market, not to create a shortage. Good. But if we find out for reasons we don't know yet that it's not enough, we will do what's necessary. Wow. Okay, very no, good. No, just a small addition to that. Is that I have to go back to a question on Donald Trump, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> right, right up, sir. Right up. So on, the, on this story, is what we want from the market is long-term sustainability and sustainable development. That is, this is the story. We do not want high oil prices. We want sustainable oil market developments. And in terms of our country, in terms of our domestic situation, we're, of course, ready for any kind of scenario. And, you know, we're living pretty well at 40. Your break even a couple of years ago was $80 a barrel. You got it down to 40. Uh, so there's been a lot of adjustment and pain for Russia, but you actually went through the exercise. Uh, quick question for Mr. Janahi in the second row. And then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Sorry, I can't take more questions just because of time. Thank you very much, yeah. uh, John. Uh, it's very refreshing to see actually Khalid Al Falah and to see Saudi Arabia's 2030 in motion. You've got three portfolios. You've just proven to everybody you can take the foreign policy on your board too. <laughs> so after that compliment, I've got a question. I mean, we are, we are talking about Aramco going public or an IPO for five percent of Aramco coming to the market within 2018 or something like that. Now, valuation is all about valuation at the end of the day, the IPO issue. The Vision 2030 was based on a $30 outlook. So from a valuation perspective, and I, as you said, you do your exercise, you do your homework. So where do you see the valuation gaps? Since 50 to 100, but where do you see the valuation of Aramco? <laughs> how much north of two trillion or how much lower than two trillion? Thank you very much. That's great. Good question, I mean, because you need a certain baseline for that valuation of $2 trillion. People, people will not buy uh, into Saudi Aramco stock because they have a view of what the price is going to be 2017 or 18 or 19. You buy equity into a company because uh, you uh, want uh, to buy uh, that equity for uh, decades uh, to come, and Aramco is going to be around for generations to come, 
given our almost uh, you know, unmatched, certainly unmatched, almost unlimited access to hydrocarbon resources. So people who buy into Saudi Aramco will buy into the quality of the company, its ability to create value, and that value will depend on the long-term value that one has for oil and gas. And I go back to what Isabel said. The world is going to need a mix of oil and gas for generations, in addition to all of the other energies, the one we know and the ones we don't know. We're going to need all of them, and every drop of oil and gas will be produced, initially mostly as a fuel, but in the long term as a source of petrochemicals and material science. And people who will buy into the largest resource base has to have a view that this is going to appreciate in value over time. And whether it reaches its ultimate valuation in terms of the, the market price in 2018 or 2022 is immaterial if we're buying for decades and generations. So I believe, I believe Aramco is, is, the, is the greatest, and of course, you, you can accuse me of being biased, but, it's, it, uh, but it is the greatest company in terms of capabilities and execution. And it has this wonderful resource that will go into the trillions of dollars as its value into the global economy uh, appreciates. OK, uh, final point, because I wanted to ask you earlier. You thought it was important to uh, highlight investment of up to $50 billion by 2023 in renewables. Many were shocked because of your vast reserves of oil. Uh, why now, in this lead up to 2030 and that broader vision, uh, you made such a bold statement? Well, we're, Vision 2030 is about diversifying the economy, but it's also about diversifying our energy sources. And diversifying means that we're going to add multiple engines to, uh, to, the, Saudi Aramco, uh, to the Saudi Arabia uh, economy, uh, and, and one of them will be new industries that we, we don't have. One of those industries will be, will be renewable. So, and at the same time, we want to maximize from that first engine that has sustained us for so long. So we want to save the liquid resources uh, that we're burning uh, in the kingdom and make them available for the long term uh, for export. We're bringing 70% of our fuel into utilities will be gas. The other 30% will be primarily gradually going into new energies. Uh, the first, the first uh, phase is, is, is this investment, 50 billion, that I talked about in Abu Dhabi. Which is, uh, uh, which is renewables of different sort, but primarily solar uh, and wind, and it will be followed up by others. There will be a nuclear uh, program uh, for power production uh, purposes that will, that will follow uh, in due course, and there will be more renewables going forward. And Saudi Arabia is going to have every viable energy source in its energy mix. We're also looking at hydrogen. We're looking at other uh, energy sources. We'll produce them sustainably. And ultimately, we aim to export them to the rest of the world. Great. Uh, let me thank you all again. Uh, Halid Al-Fale, Maxime Moreskin, uh, Isabel Kosher, and Fatih Birol. A uh, nice round of applause for the panelists, and thanks for coming today.